anger and you know being challenged with your authority to exert on the child you know with a situation uh, or another person and sometimes these two people when they come together instead of appreciating each other there's quick reactive statements and anger mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and they seem to be in a pattern mm -hmm. and it seems to be you know consistent uh, I think I better I just avoid this person because this is a big problem yep. but sometimes you yep. can't avoid that person yep. because they're somehow part of the family and or you know mm -hmm. connected um, Does it take two parties to be present with that moment or the thought? Because at times you might be prepared to accept and to, if I use the word heal the emotion mm -hmm. or be present with it, but the other person wants to keep pushing because they're waiting for a reaction and they're wanting to fight. <laughs> and it could be they have low cortisol and it just makes them feel better when they get a reaction, uh -huh. whatever it is, uh -huh. right? How do you deal with that? These are great questions, and it's uh, a tribute to your level of awareness <laughs> that you're asking these great questions. Mm -hmm. I would say categorically, absolutely, when I counsel people mm -hmm. about relationships, I start with, I, I love tricky little phrases because I think people go home and they'll remember, you know, a catchphrase, we all like those things. But I always go, the other person is irrelevant. This is your reality experiencing a dream. And I don't want to over-metaphysicalize it because that can easily be misused. But in this context, it's an appropriate way to look at it. It's like that person is doing something that's triggering something in me that's unhealed. Otherwise, I would be knowing that the universe is perfect and I'm okay and everything's okay just the way it is. I wouldn't get plugged in. If I'm plugged in emotionally, I've got work to do. Now, it's way better if you have somebody else on the other side of it that wants to play and go, hey, you know, there's a little, little rough energy going on, it's a little gnarly here right now. Uh, instead of going, I can't stand when you say that to me and I hate it, I'm all plugged in and you remind me of my father. It's like, you know, actually feeling, I'm feeling a little scared and insecure right now because I feel like you're not really loving me and I don't know what to say, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is. And the other person melts, usually. If in Usually some therapies, things, we, we are told to react at their same voice, volume, and intensity because when you back down, that's exactly what they were looking for, and then it mm -hmm. somehow fuels the argument a little further. Um, but you're saying allow your emotions to be prepared to live with that emotion mm -hmm. at that moment. There's, there's no totally right formula because just Understand. as you're saying there are different situations but if you start with at this moment I'm experiencing upset with this person what do I need to learn here about me what am I resisting or avoiding right now now I'm not saying become a doormat and not have healthy boundaries actually when you start to love your boundaries you start to love yourself your boundaries get way more clear sorry nobody does that to me Okay, that doesn't feel good. Okay, but you first have to be willing to feel everything. Okay, like a typical example of that is in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. Someone who was abused as a child but had to swallow it or deal with it or block it, whenever they feel anybody critical coming at them or anyone abusive, they immediately block that feeling because as a child, they couldn't do anything about it. So rather than just feel the pain, that comes in, they found a way to deal with the pain through an addiction, through an avoidance, through a, a happy behavior or a denial behavior or an aggressive behavior, whatever they're doing to cover up that inside is a little child there that just wants to cry and cry and cry and say, help me, help me, please don't hurt me again, <laughs> okay? But that wasn't working as a child. They just got beat more for it. So they develop all of these right. shells and mechanisms and def defense mechanisms and behaviors. So. A person that can't feel inside of themselves an area of pain, so in this case, let's say victimized abuse, they're not, when I talked about how you could feel something in, in the chair across from you, they can't recognize it when an abusive person comes into their space. 
if you're healthy and if you have self-esteem and self-love and somebody abusive comes into your field, you go, whoa, what? I don't like that energy. This guy's really a jerk, you know, like I don't like being spoken to that way or this person's really arrogant or they're into themselves or they're overbearing or they're controlling or they're mean or they're dominant, whatever it is. But you feel it right away. You pick it up. You can see. Mm -hmm. That's because the part of you that's sensitive to what isn't okay r vibrates immediately. So now you get a woman, let's say, who had an abusive history. That's all she knows. She gets attracted to a guy that's abusive. On a certain level, she is looking for that experience because there's a part of herself inside that you might call the inner child, you know, or the shamans would call it a soul fragment. It's really just a part of myself that I don't want to experience. I don't want to feel, so I shut it down. And we also make ourselves wrong for that. You know, oh, there must be something about me that's not okay. Otherwise, why are my parents abusing me or my older brother or whatever it is? Um, so we start judging ourselves. And when you go in and have the experience, who wants to be a crybaby? It's not, not very survival oriented to walk around going, I feel helpless. I feel scared. You know, we're all like, get out there. Let's do it. And underneath, underneath all of that is, Holy cow, I don't know how my fingernails are growing. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what my next thought is. You know, I'm not in control at all. The real power comes from surrender, comes from openness. Yeah. And once you're open, you're tapped into everything. You've got infinite supply of energy, awareness. You're guided. Everything's taken care of. The really powerful people are the ones that go, I don't do anything. I'm just breathing. <laughs> you know, And it's the people who are demonstrating the most outward power from an ego point of view who are the most insecure and the most scared. It's the exact opposite of what it looks like. You know, and the martial arts masters will tell you that, you know, the little old guy just putting around to throw everyone around the room. He's not trying to prove anything anymore. <laughs> so with 50 Shades of Grey being released on Valentine's Day, it seems that there's many women who are intrigued and uh, this discussion about, um, I guess, SM or sadomasochistic, uh, masochistic, mm -hmm. um, surrender, um, domination, domination. These are emotions that somehow intrigue and turn people on. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. Oh, good, good question. I don't have a lot of experience with it um, personally, so I, I have to speak about the basic principles I know and how we you might. you mentioned the word surrender, so yeah, I was searching yeah. for when a person is in an intimate relationship with another, oftentimes that relationship in the bedroom is enhanced mm -hmm. when one or the other is prepared at times to surrender to the emotions and the pleasure that they're experiencing. Mm -hmm. The other person's prepared to somehow, we can use the word dominate, but contribute and or assist in the process or create energy or um, situations and stories and fantasy and play or mm -hmm. if it's mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. if it's visual, if it's touch, to help that person through this process of experiencing something that at times in the past they might have been afraid to experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, there's a tricky overlap here, and again, it's, it really is shades of gray because it's everything from pure play in an innocent way to really, really damaged psychopathology. <laughs> you know, I think that's why there's confusion about it because I don't think it's just one story with the people that have that outer. Another one of my sayings, it doesn't matter what you do, it matters where you're coming from. So I would use my principles to search an individual and go, what is really going on with you in this situation? Where are you coming from? Is there a lot of shame? Is there a lot of guilt? Is there a lot of insecurity where you need to be controlled or control somebody else? You know, are you acting, are, is this really coming from the heart? Is this a loving thing to do? Or is this damaged psychology playing itself out for a kick or a thrill or an addictive fix? And I would have to really be with an individual to determine 
Like I know some people that play with some of those things, and mm -hmm. they seem just sort of delightfully free. Like they're having a good time. Like they're going to a yes. costume party and they're yeah. playing out roles and they're into <laughs> acting and yeah. and and that for them is really just makes things rich and playful. Mm -hmm. I I would guess and. I can't stand on any solid ground here that a, a lot of it really is people acting out trauma and abuse Interesting. And, and you know looking for a way to get stimulation when just sitting quietly under a Bodhi tree taking your next breath should be all that you can possibly stand <laughs> you know and well, there's a lot of outward seeking for stimulation on the outer which is where sex addiction comes from or, or a race car addiction or a golf addiction or anything else you want to be addicted to. Mm -hmm. We're all addicted to most everything, you know, because mm -hmm. we're looking outside of ourselves. Now, that doesn't mean any of those things are wrong, but it's where you're coming from. Are you giving power to something out there to make you feel better because you don't feel good, which means you're coming from lack, and no matter what you do, it's never going to heal what's in here. It's only going to temporarily distract you or alleviate the pain you're feeling because of your inner emptiness? Or are you just filled with joy and life is to play and like, oh, that's fun, let's go do that, but you're not attached to it. So if it doesn't happen, it isn't going to affect your happiness. But as soon as people give things power to the other gods, at that moment they're victimized. The moment you need something outside of yourself to be okay, it owns you because if it's taken away from you, then you don't feel good. So now you'll do things to make sure that it stays the way it is. And that's not what life is about. Life is about letting go, flowing, and receiving whatever it is that next is coming to you. And the moment you hang on to something, now you're in a crystallized structure. You're resisting the ongoing flow and movement and change. If you resist change, you die. You know, I love the way Bob Dylan said it. If you're not wow. busy being born, you're busy dying. You know, one of his famous quotes. Life is about movement and flow. The, an old Hindu saying is, life is a bridge, don't build your house on it. And I call that fluidity of consciousness. A state of grace and a state of inner peace and awakened consciousness is simply available to whatever comes. Now that, again, all of these teachings can be misused. That doesn't mean you're passive. That doesn't mean you don't create an empire. But the difference is where are you coming from? Are you at peace? Are you completely enjoying gratitude and love? And out of that flows creativity and expression. I love to dance. I want to paint pictures. I want to heal people. Oh, you know, it's just flowing through you. But if it doesn't happen, you're still OK. That's not where most of us create from. We create from a need to achieve in order to feel good about ourselves, in order to feel, feel safe, to create money. To, you know, We're always controlling. But if you go deep at any point and you say to somebody, stop, what's going on right now? The first thing that bubbles up is their insecurities, their fears. And then we deal with those by recognizing that there's nothing to run away from. That was just the mind's conditioning. The, the depth of thought, um, uh, when I read the book, um, and by the way, I prefer to listen to my books. Um, I can look at the script as it's going by, but um, Oprah wrote a book, What Do I Really Know Now? Mm. And she got to a place where she was talking about her love and sexuality and trying to hang on to some of her early loves and um, doing some things like throwing her boyfriend's keys in the toilet so he wouldn't leave when he was trying to leave <laughs> to leave her life, you know. and. She reflected back on that and tore up a letter that she'd written to him that she thought was very um, pathetic in her words to, to an extent. And she said, well, am I comfortable with myself? Am I comfortable with the love that I experience within my life? And what is going on with myself? Um, and she felt that what she knows now is that is the case. It doesn't mm -hmm. require. Uh, another being to express love. If she wants to be with a friend, she can. If she wants to uh, be by herself, she can. And um, sometimes, though, uh, with Valentine's Day coming up, or maybe it's past at this point, but um, people enjoy because we have social connection. We're we're hurting creatures and. 
mm -hmm. and uh, and we we like a leader and we like to be in groups and uh, oftentimes life and death and hanging on to life and death depends on uh, do we feel connected whether it be even connected mm -hmm. to a dog that we love mm -hmm. and so to interpret our genetics or our origin or our need for survival, I guess, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and then to somehow identify at times the emotion of let's label that and oftentimes with sexuality and intimacy there's if it's outside of our realm of experience well we better label that because that's mm -hmm. not something I'm familiar with and so it's interesting, you know, what what we as beings are ex are experiencing now, and what or if we experience something past death or not. And like you said, you know, is what my fingernails growing right now, and why? And why do they grow faster when I take certain supplements? And mm -hmm. why do I feel more vital when I use certain, you know, foods and supplements and and, and bioidentical hormones? And you know, there are obviously billions of little uh, molecules that uh, that do um, enhance our life experiences. Mm -hmm. And then being heady enough to want to drop down into conversations and thought. Uh, when I go to New York and I speak and I talk to people and I say, you know, the reason we come up with these ideas and, and uh, these protocols um, and these philosophies is because we just sit out in California on, on along the edge of the beach and we just kind of rock and just like meditate and just, <laughs> just think all day long. That's all we do, yeah. you know, nuts, berries, and fruits, and we just kind of hang out. And they think that's hilarious because they think we do, you know. And um, But at a point, you know, we say, oh, we don't have stress in California because that's, you know, we just hang out. Um, <laughs> I guess they'd say that in Fiji, they'd say that in yeah. Bali and, yeah. and, you know, other places in the world. So when we skate to this nirvana environment, you know, and after a while we get um, uh, I island fever, I guess some mm -hmm. would call it, and we want to come back to the society, to the social, and kind of hang out with fun people. So I, for me, it's circling back to um, time is limited and sharing time with people that I appreciate, that are intelligent, that are, make me want to think and evaluate my life and um, make some change or remain. As one of my dear friends says, it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, uh, you know, even what, what I heard is when you were talking about the herd instinct and how good it is to be with people. That's perfectly okay until you get attached to it. Attached to it means I can't be without it. Yeah. So once there's choice, everything's available. Yeah. You know, and, and we look inside to see am I, if I'm creating stress because I suddenly feel that that's more important than, than listening to myself, than being with myself. So it's... Uh, so how do people reach you? What is your website? And uh, um, I actually don't have a website at the moment. I went into hibernation for quite a few years, partly because I had a very, very serious case of Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. Good old tick bites. I used to live in an endemic area, and I didn't know for many years what I had, and I was going back and forth to India. Finally, one trip in India, I just crashed. Uh, mm -hmm. And I got home, and I was having trouble walking up a flight of stairs, and nobody knew what was wrong with me. And so, but me, the great holistic doctor that's supposed to be cutting edge, uh, we didn't really know what that was about at the time. Yeah. And so I spent a lot of years wiping out my hypothalamus and my neuroendocrine system with the uh, Lyme toxins. And I'm doing much, much better now. Every year I'm getting better and better and better. Mm -hmm. And I think it was just part of my life path to be taken out where the only thing I got to do was focus on myself and, and working on myself and getting well. And other people would come to me and maybe spend a little time on the phone with them, but I haven't had a practice in some years because of that. And now I'm feeling like uh, I probably don't want to go back into a practice. There are bigger things to do on the planet. Bigger sounds bad, but I feel like I can probably do more good and reach more people and be more in alignment with what I really want to share than seeing one person at a time, although I do see people. You know, if they want to come and have a session, I'll do something. Mm -hmm. um, so we're 
when I get back from this conference, I'm going to get back to working on the book, which has basically been written for 20 years, but I never really put it together. So I started over again recently. And it's going to be called You Get There by Being Here. And it's going to be really basic, what I call closing the gap explanation of what people are missing that have been in all the great teachings and all the healing arts and everything we all know, but people don't know how to bring it into this moment and look at it and go, wow, I get what he was talking about. I can do that. You know, I can, I can wake up in this moment by bringing it back in and loving the part about me that I've been habitually avoiding or judging. And if we find such sweet things, I always say to people, I guarantee you that in 40 years of doing this, I have never found anything inside of anybody that wasn't love and that wasn't wonderful and joyous. So the deepest, darkest stuff that you're hiding inside, when you actually get there, what you're going to find is a part of yourself that you disconnected from in childhood. But you need that part. You need the inner child. You need the strong one that's got the personal power that's now showing up as anger. You need the, the sensitive little inner child that needs its needs met that's showing up as insecurity or greed. And so when you go past the first layer and drop in and feel the emotion, that emotion is an part of your energetic body and part of your consciousness that you've disconnected from that always turns out to be wonderful. And the more of those parts we integrate, the more full we become. So it goes back to the really basic principle of saying yes to everything. I like to call my path, when I, I give it a name, the path of inclusion. In other words, if there's anything you're saying no to, if there's anything you're resisting, if there's anything you're judging, avoiding, separate from, controlling, take a look at it because that's happening inside and it doesn't feel good. That's stress. That's what causes illness if we go back to that same metaphor again. I keep thinking of the shoulder. I never finished, but we probably need to end. If you're unwinding a shoulder, mm -hmm. you just follow the body. And okay. you get to a certain point, and it goes, oh, I don't want to go here. And the emotion starts to come up. Mm -hmm. All you do is just stay there for a moment. And the nervous system goes, oh, I've been holding a trauma pattern that if I ever put my arm in this direction, it reminds me of the time I got hurt. So I don't want to go there because it hurts. So we resist pain. That's where we started this conversation. When we start to sub get something we don't like, we go, oh, no, I don't want to. OK. As soon as we cramped up, we've just made ourselves sick. So just being present with what is relaxes the resistance and the energy and the health flows and the well-being flows. And we come back to ourselves. It's really that simple. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Well, we have a chance to reach a lot of people and when your book comes out and in the interim to think about a very profound conversation. <laughs> I'm with Dr. Ken Wolkoff and this is Dr. Nick Delgado. It's been a pleasure being with you.